everyone, and welcome back to the Crawford's House Podcast. I am in a new digs, new place, new home, uh, with a new season. Yes, this season is going to be very exciting. Uh, I'm not going to stop after 10 episodes like last time. Uh, that wasn't planned, by the way. Just want you to know that. That wasn't planned. Um, however, um, sorry, I'm just making sure I'm not peeking there for you guys. Uh, however, I am back uh, kind of with a bigger, with a planned season for bigger, better um year than ever um so i'm gonna start things off locally here because we're in the midst of this covid crisis so i hope you're all staying safe um but uh, i'm not gonna be able to have a lot of people in house obviously because uh you can't have a lot of people coming from digital communities and going so we're gonna go virtual this year we're gonna have a lot of uh video chats and i actually have a very huge uh video chat planned for next episode be on the lookout uh just I've always been into competitive eaters, and uh, I, I finally reached out to my favorite one, and uh, he reached back and said he wanted to do an interview, and, uh, you know, I also reached out to his girlfriend who's a competitive eater, and she said she wants in too, so I'm just saying, there's a couple of huge episodes that I just have in my pocket, um, so let's do it. Before we get down to business, uh, I want to thank you all for viewing. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you feel like it, hit the up button for the like, because uh, everybody always appreciates that. And it encourages people to come and check it out because it shows this is a good episode, right? All right. Welcome to my first guest of the Crawford House Podcast, season two, longtime friend. I actually even made a video about maybe a hardcore scene back in the day in college that got me a really good mark because shout out Joel Parker uh, for the incredible uh, video work that he does. Um, but, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Tanner Klein. What is up? Tanner, how's it going, buddy? Welcome to Crawford Joe's podcast and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, man. Well, I mean, I've always wanted to do stuff like this with you, especially. So. Oh, well, thank you, man. I really, I, I've been told that I have a good, uh, a good interviewing style, which is hilarious because it was the one course that I did not care about at all in college. I'm sorry, Brian. I agree. Right? Yeah. You know, it's it, it it's a, it's a hard one to get into. You're like, you want me to just sit there and interview people? That's ridiculous. But then you do it, it's actually kind of fun. How the turntables. How the turn how the tables turn. Uh before we start things off, not selling out, but I'm gonna crack my can of liquid death. It's a pretty good, pretty good water. Maybe you should send me a case like a sponsor more liquid death. Sweet tea for life. Buddy here is representing Arizona. Shout out Arizona. Uh, I think everybody's had a can of Arizona. That's the one you always used to get. 99 it's cents. Is it still a buck? only. Is, oh, Shout you got the Charlie's sweet Variety. Tea. Ooh, Charlie's Variety. You got the contraband. They do. They got that illegal contraband. Not sure how they're getting over the border. Don't want to know. Don't ask questions. Don't tell. Possible sponsorship in the future? <laughs> Come on now. Wouldn't that be dope? Um, so, Tanner, we're going to start things off, obviously. Uh, if you check out the video that I linked in the uh, description, uh, the hardcore scene with Tanner Klein, we did we dove deep into... Uh, well, I can't say deep because it's only like four and a half minutes, but we kind of dove into the hardcore scene in London there. I want to definitely work my way into that because I think like, you're one of the most uh, knowledgeable people on the topic and the times that I've, you know, met individuals in London and, uh, you know, Chatham area. And you've ventured so far to Kentucky and you've been everywhere, uh, Montreal, if I'm not mistaken as well. Like, uh, yeah, for sure. So you, you've had a track, you've, you've done a tour bus run. So you've got to, you know, you've got to. No buses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, shout out Cold Shoulder. They, they have their own little bus. So that's awesome. Shout out Cold Shoulder for the bus hook up for the ride maybe next time you know <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding um so i'm gonna go back to when uh tanner tanner was a child i was so you know then, you still know. am yeah still a young gun still a young yeah. gun for sure uh what what got you into music when you were a child um my father basically um everyone shout out rob rob legend uh everyone in my family is pretty musically like uh, they're in, interested like more than an average person, I would say. Okay. Um, my dad though plays guitar and he always has. So nice. Growing up, ever since I was a little baby, I was like, "What is this thing? Yeah, what hand? is this with six strings that yeah. makes Jimi Hendrix come out? Like, what's going on here?" So I would just say my dad really watching him play guitar and just uh, seeing someone else's passion for music from. So is that the first instrument you ended up learning was the guitar? Uh, no, actually, it was the drums. The drums. See, is not yeah. how is that funny? You watch someone playing guitar, but then you end up playing a completely different the instrument. Guitar was too hard. Uh, it is. It is a difficult. One. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, <laughs> six I strings was too much, man. Yeah, yeah. I like the bass because it's only got four. But I'm gonna get into that whole other. So, what? How did you get your first drum set? Um, actually, 
my well my dad knew that i was interested in playing the drums they debated getting them obviously because they're pretty annoying especially i was very loud especially when the child is learning this is probably. when i was seven right so like i didn't know when to stop well, obviously you know you think you're better than you are at seven years old yeah but um, everyone's a superstar i believe it was for my eighth birthday I came downstairs in the morning and there was a drum set down there. Wow. Uh, my dad had a friend from work help him out who was also a drummer and gave me a good deal. And it was, uh, I actually still have it. I mean, it's packed away now. Still but, have uh, the drum kit from yeah. It was a child's drum kit, I assume. So it's it was little... actually an adult kit. Really? Because my dad thought he was like, I don't want to get him a child's kit because eight years old they're growing yeah you're gonna grow up out of the yeah, kit there. so uh, i grew into it basically which i'm thankful for that because you know you gotta save money and uh i still have it still it works so that's amazing um so then you start playing drums at eight how did where did that go so did you rehearse you kept rehearsing for a couple of years did you get progressively got better well how uh, what was the journey i definitely like Right when I got it, I was always playing them just every day. Like, you know, the excitement of a new, new uh, or first instrument. and um, But it definitely, I feel like, you know, being a kid and still wanting to go play outside with my friends, I kind of stopped for a little while. I wouldn't say I stopped, but it wasn't as frequent. It's like the old expression, it's not on the main burner anymore. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. And I think, like, there's a lot of learning curves. And when you're a little bit smaller, it's harder to get through some of that. But I did do drum lessons, thankfully, with at that Frank's in Chatham. Shout out to Frank's. Yeah, awesome place. A lot of talented. I just want to. I don't want to shout out just Frank's. I also want to give a shout out to Musical Strings and Things and exactly. Tony's. Tony's. Um, awesome. You know, I took music lessons at Tony's, and honestly, it was a, an incredible, incredible experience. Very. It was. It, it was really nice when there's a there's a music shop there that has trained professionals that know exactly what they're doing that want to help kids. Learn, exactly, you know? it's a really good environment there too. I mean, I can't speak for lessons at the other places. I'm sure. I've heard no, Tony's. Things. Tony's was amazing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's awesome. It's good to have that. I mean, you can watch YouTube videos and everything, but the I, human connection is always going to make yeah, it more, uh, I think, beneficial in my opinion. Yeah, I've just been recently picked up the bass and I've kind of just been watching like Mark Hoppus play bass lines and learning from his playing. Yeah. And it's like, this isn't the same. Man. Exactly. This yeah. isn't anywhere near the same. Um, interesting. So then, so you ended up just starting learning, uh, for a couple of years there. When, when did you end up like, uh, when did you end up progressing into the band scene? How did high school end up going for you? Did you end up venturing down the music scene in high school? Um, well, so my first introduction to the music scene was when I was 10, actually. Um, my sister, uh, she was doing Irish dancing, funny enough. Just Amazing. That was, her, that was her thing. She's five years older than me. So like she would have been 15 at the time. Okay. She was friends with local musician Jamie Miller. Shout out Jamie Miller, local uh, legend. So uh, she took me to see his old band, Her Life Story. Anyone from Chatham oh. knows Her Life Story. That, oh, those were the days, man. And I, so I listened to like at the time, like, you know, rock music, yep. like Nickelback, stuff that I heard on the radio or my dad showed me. Yeah, 89 Metallica, half days. But I never heard anything too extreme. Um, at the time, obviously didn't know what it was, but... Uh, their band opened with a Devil Wears Prada cover, which is one of my favorite bands Great now. Band. And I saw people mosh for the first time, which was absolutely crazy. I thought they were fighting. <laughs> They're fighting, right? Away. <laughs> and uh, so that was my first introduction, though, when I was like 10. And then my sister kind of stopped going to show, like going, because she was not into the music. She was more supporting her friend. And uh, once I was 12, uh, my parents started letting me go to the local shows with my friends, like, you know, unsupervised. Um that's when I started meeting people who played music around the city. And uh, I didn't start playing music in a band until I was about 14. So there was a little gap of just going to shows, meeting people. You, you just know, kind of, you're watching and learning the environment. Yeah. Almost. You know, I'd call that, uh, you're just, you're building the castle. You're yeah. not living in it yet. And I was thankful that uh, some of the older people in the Chatham music scene were, they were all welcoming. They That's a big, I think that's a huge misunderstanding with the hardcore scene because the way, like you said, the, the mosh pit, it seems so, yeah. it is aggressive. Don't get me wrong. I watch yeah. a lot of videos where people are just getting hit in the head, and, you know, but as soon as somebody accidentally gets hit in the head, those exact same people are there like, are you okay? I'm so sorry. Exactly. Like, you drop your glasses. I've seen entire pits stop to help somebody find their glasses and then resume. Yeah. Um, yeah, honestly, some of the most friendliest people. Um, interesting. So then what was, uh, what, what was your first band that you ended up kind of, did you end up creating a band when you saw that? Did you end up joining a band? What, what ended up kind of pushing that? Um, so actually, I when I was around... 10 i 
Sorry, I got my first bass guitar. No, it was the same age with the like, just like kind of a couple, a couple yeah, years a couple there. Years, instruments. I was starting to get in, wanted to learn like a string instrument, but I was nice. didn't feel like I. I don't know. I don't know if it was just my dad played guitar, so I wanted to do something different. But I wanted to play bass. I was had recently got into the band Slipknot. I mean, and, uh, Pulse uh, of the Maggots, man. Uh, Paul Gray had passed away when I was ten. Like I think just like a few days after I, my 10th birthday, I think. So it was around then that I got the bass right and I uh, started taking lessons and at Frank's. Shout out Frank's again. <laughs> yes. And uh, I was waiting for my lessons one day and this guy, um, who I won't say his name yet. Okay. But yeah. We'll standing, build up to that. Never he was remember. standing at the counter and uh, he had seen me there a few times. I knew that he was the singer of a local band called Overcoming a Kingdom. Okay. Which Adam Folk might know. Bailey Claremont. Okay. Uh, yep. So he came over to me and he said, oh, I, he said, you play bass, right? And I was like, yeah, I was 12. He's yeah. like maybe 17 or 15 at the time. And he's like, oh, I'm trying to start a band. And uh, it's funny to think about it now, you know, with all the stranger danger in the world. Yeah, man, approaching but, a minor in a music store and asking him if he wants to come <laughs> over and play in your band probably he, isn't a way to definitely maybe said, approach somebody. But uh, hey, Bailey, it was a different time, yeah, brother. He added me on Facebook. I gave him my name, and then he's like, "You want to come over uh, tomorrow?" And what a what a total weird. We way went over. We like, recorded an EP that That's day. amazing. This band was called Bird Bones Fall. I never played a show, but that was my first time. Is the EP out there? It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, man. But uh, that was my first time like working with anyone to like make music. I mean, they wrote everything, but that was my first time as a band. But uh, my first real band would have been the Dateless Losers. Who I remember the Dateless Losers, yeah, another yeah. you know Chatham area band there. Which that was only about a year after that. Which okay, was, uh, I met um, Ryan yep. and Hanson. Cameron Dubay. They uh, there was a music video shoot for Letter Bomb. Yep, showed a Letter Bomb. And, you know, uh, classic. I went just because I was a young kid who thought these guys were really cool because yep. they were in a band and uh, and they made good music. They did exactly, and they invited me to or they invited a bunch of people who ever wanted to be in the music video and. Uh, I met Ryan and Cameron, who were a year older than me, and uh, that night they asked me if I wanted to sleep over because they were having a party after the video, and uh, then we said we were going to start a band. And that's just, that's what, right there, right? Out the whole summer. That that's was, amazing. Yeah. And did the summer end up getting a band? Did the band happen? Did an EP get formed throughout that summer? We, we did. We, uh, we, well, first, that, so we, I played bass, um, and they both played guitar. So we needed a drummer for sure. That's like the main, the hardest thing to find. That is a hard one to fill, but once you find yeah. one, you know, they're... Thankfully, Cameron's older brother had a great friend named Cody King. Cody King. Another legend. Absolutely. I didn't want to say it, but I mean, like, yeah. I can't keep just giving out legends. People won't believe me, but like, come on, there's a lot of legends in this yeah. city. And uh, he was down to play drums for us. He had never played drums in a band, but he had always kind of messed around he with them. He liked drummed on percussion a little bit there. Yeah, and then uh, we went to a sound system show, local, another band from another Chatham. Another Chatham band, dude. Great uh, band. Probably and, at uh, one of those retired venues. Yeah, I yeah. was at um, Kingston Park outside. And well, it, that's almost a retired venue. Yeah. This uh, <laughs> R.I.P. to the R.I.P. to the pond, man. But, the pond um, was a great place, but yeah. Sound System covered a Misfits song, and they had Steve nice. and Imason come on and sing it. Shout out them. Steve again, another <laughs> legend, final, dude. Yeah, the final the boss. Final he's the final form. He, uh, he's a legend. We asked legend. him because we loved his energy. Anyone who's met Steve, Fuzz. Oh. shout out CV Fuzz. CV Fuzz. Uh, anyone who's met him knows his energy is unmatchable. He's the seventies in a person, dude. When I uh, quick little Steve story, he came up and visited me for a couple days in London, and I had my I just got my Sega Genesis, I think it was back, and uh, we sat there and played like Boulder Boulder Buster and just all these classic games hooked up to the, just exactly just the most classic. I miss you, Steve. I miss you, Steve. I haven't seen Steve in so long now, man. He's doing his life now, and you know, obviously we just uh, yeah got to reconnect. We'll have to get back this summer. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, he was the I final, miss you, Steve. I hope he watches it. He was the final piece of the puzzle. and uh, It all clicked into place, and then it all... Played our form. first show that New Year... Or no, that... I believe it was September? Like, in the fall, near the winter, we played our first show, which was just in Cameron's basement for, like, our friend's birthday party. Yeah, but I, met, I remember going to a couple of those basement shows. I wasn't huge in that friend group at the time, obviously, uh, but those shows were pretty... Cool, they were man. Awesome. They it were was, like a good house party. It was a we. There was some great times. Good times there. out of that house. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. And the parents even were cool about it. Like yeah. the parents were involved and like really cool. Because if not mistaken, I remember the parents were both musicians as well. 
Uh, or maybe I'm, just one of them. I'm not totally. I don't remember. I can't correctly. remember, but they were definitely very supportive of all of us. And that very bad punk music, loud. But that helps so much in like a support to have supportive parents when you're going into a punk rock career, even just a band, because. Like you said, you know, when you just first you got your drums when you're a kid, you're not you're not playing good. No. It sounds awful. But you're learning to play good. Exactly. You know, and you know, I've seen you play um cause you you still feel for drums sometimes, if I'm mistaken. Uh, I have rare occasions. Rare for occasions. Sure, but... So it's more of the more of the singing and the bass. Yeah. Exactly. Um and, and you know, it's it's an interesting thing to like have to learn to do. You gotta be bad before you get good. I think that's oh, of real, course. you know, I think that's so to have those supportive parents to 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 back you there when you like you said when I'm just a hard rock crappy punk rock it's like basement. very important for like to form a formative of like just like they would let us the parents would let us play their parties to their friends you know what I mean right like, which is crazy opens up whole new we, audience we couldn't at the time we were well I mean I was fourteen the other guys were fifteen and we couldn't can't really go play bars play, and, play bars I mean yeah. we. We definitely played the elephant's nest many times. Shout out the nest, great local uh, when local we were place. fourteen and fifty. I don't know how it happened, why they let us. I don't know if they don't just, ask, don't question, don't you? Know? We didn't. And uh, but you know, just being able to yeah play in the the that Cameron or the Dubai basement was a very like formative, very thing. energetic. I think place a lot of musicians in the city. Yeah. And like just the whole, you know, playing Encore or Eight Ball or Twisters, whatever you remember it as. Rest in peace, dude. Those places were sick. I remember, yeah. still remember seeing a show. I, uh, I, I can't, I can't remember who the band was. Um, actually, I think it might have been Jay, one of Jay, I think it might have been Jamie Miller's band at the time playing like opening for a show or headlining show. Yeah, her they, life story. Yeah, her life story. And they had, uh, there's like a little pizza shop, if I'm not mistaken, to the front of the place. And I, you could walk Munchies. Right, munchies. Yeah, yes. you could walk right up to the front and grab a slice. I remember grabbing a slice of pizza yeah. there. And God, Chatham had... Uh, I really hope somebody does something with that place one day. But that, that, that side of town's a little... Um, it's, I mean, with the with the with Coco's Pizza getting developed on that corner, that's a really nice development there. It is. You know, and you got a whole... I think that really side of town could develop. I really... I know it's hard to believe, but I really think Chatham's coming back on the boom. You know, you're, you're, a lot of new houses are being built. Yep. I don't agree with the pricing. I just want to get it, that out there now. It's absolutely that's ridiculous. Global, almost. Oh, it's crazy, man. But it's crazy because they're they're cheap. They're be, the building fast, cheap. I'm not going to get into it. I could. <laughs> I, I'm very passionate about the realty. It's crazy. I never thought I'd be about realty, but whatever. Um, it it. I've never thought I would see communities being built as fast as they are in Chatham. Mm -hmm. Property being sold as quick as it is. And if you walk downtown, there's a lot of places that are renovating or just opened up. or Yeah, a lot know, of new, like, um, new, new businesses. Yeah, things for people to do. There's a lot more op like uh, opportunities for growth. For just yes, man. Yeah, yeah, especially with the mall for sale. I think yeah. if a, maybe a big Toronto company comes in and sees that, and they're like, hey, man, we can come in and buy this and bring maybe a couple of those Toronto stores... Imagine having a point between London and Windsor stop at, you know, yeah. having the traffic from Sarnia, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, let's quit driving to Sarnia and have Sarnia drive to us now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm getting diverted, but, uh, so interesting. So then you've, uh, you end up meeting the, uh, the band, the man, the man's, sorry, the, the, <laughs> the band, band with the man's, um, for that summer, you guys end up creating an album. Do you guys end up doing, you guys end up doing shows? Yeah. What ends up happening there? I know I know that band no longer is together, obviously, but yeah, that's we, what happens with little bands. You know, that everybody's yeah. been in a dozen bands, it seems like, because that's development. Yeah, that's how you get better. Never had a last show or anything. We just, we ended up living in different cities. You know, life goes Life fast. goes different ways, man, for sure. Like, yeah, but um, yeah, we played shows, you know, in Windsor, Chatham, London. We would play Sarnia, like a lot. Sarnia and Windsor were big cities for us at the time. Uh, like very thankful for those I, scenes. I do remember actually a couple of Sarnia shows, if I'm not mistaken. The across, Trinity Lounge. Across right. the street from that big parking lot. Yes. And you looked out on the river. The old strip club, Trinity. Yeah, old strip club. Yeah, wow. Well, you know, I wish it was a curve strip club. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> strip club upstairs, band downstairs. But, or the reverse, however that would work. But Yeah, so we played those. We just played shows for, well, I mean, I would say we were probably active until like 2018-ish so like 2000 like four years maybe five almost right on right on um lots of different members honestly we had that was just i mean that's normal again you know when you start a band when you're 14 it's not yeah not everybody's gonna stick around so. it's it's definitely the way i look at it man and it's definitely like the evolution of music because like uh you, you look at like the 60s 
uh, not a lot of people had the access to instruments almost. Oh, of course. So then when you had a couple people that had jammed or sang, you know, the bands just kind of created themselves and there wasn't anybody too interchangeable with, you know, you yeah. kind of made it work. Um, and then the other thing kind of went into the 80s and 90s. Um, I, the, the 90s really where I reference a lot because you look at like the punk bands that really are staples um, that are simple three or four pieces, you know, Blink-22, Sum 41, yeah. Green Day, um, Alkaline Trio even, you know, even getting the Christian bands in there because, you know, they're, they're punky, you know, yeah, they're yeah, for punky, sure. yeah, MXPX. Yeah, MX, I don't know that one, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, man, just, uh, it, it's a really, it, it's just a different time now where there's so much interchangeable musicians that it, the energy's got to work and, you know, not that the energies didn't work. But it's just like, you end up just being like, you know what, uh, we're all going in different directions. I hope you guys all end up finding people that really jam your yeah, energy. And, and there is. And they have, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Like, you know, uh, the people have found their, 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 not groups, but their cliches. Their cliches, their people. Yeah, cliches sure. aren't a bad thing, I'm thinking. I'm not using the bad word. Yeah, for it's sure. Not, not a curse word in a sense. So, that progressed into a couple more bands being cre created. Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, then... Do you want me to talk about? Just it? go, yeah, go yeah. off, man. So, I, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to form the questions properly so I don't jump ahead. But no I just worries. want to let you take the torch, man. The, take the Olympic the torch. The next step, I guess, after the Dateless yes, Losers, the next be, step. We uh, after the Dateless Losers, I we I didn't have anything else going on really. Um, the Dateless Losers would play some side uh, shows. There was a time where we kind of would play like one or two shows, like in a year or six months, and we were kind of starting to widen out. And uh, I, there was just some time I didn't play in any bands. I was just kind of, you know, in high school working and trying to meet new people. I was getting into hardcore a lot more, like the more aggressive style of music. And I wanted to kind of play that because the Davis Losers, I don't know if we mentioned, was a ska punk band. It was a ska punk, yeah, Very yeah. different from what... Dude, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I mean, I have a brain injury, obviously, so my memory never served me correctly. Um, was there not a skate park show? There was. I, we uh, we didn't play or anything. But okay. Sound System Obscure and Elastic play. I remember Elastic, it like that was yesterday. Yeah. Which is crazy, man. Those were... COVID times is just what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um, so go on. Go on. Oh, uh, so yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Like, no worries. Uh, so I was just in high school. Um, I had known... <coughs> Um, well, Ryan, of course, he was in the Dateless Losers, and uh, Nick, who was just Nick Grand, just in the, he's uh, known in the scene, played in lots of bands when I was first getting into the scene. Um, they had a hardcore band at the time. They had played one show, I believe, and they were just about to release an EP. And uh, I hadn't talked to these guys in quite some time, but we started to talk and kind of, you know, start getting back into each other's lives and hanging out and. Uh, they asked me to play bass because they needed a bass player, and that was how I joined Watering Hole. Watering which Hole was a pretty big chunk of my mu in terms of my music career, like playing. That's been a very important part of. Yeah, because Watering Hole's now been around for like uh, six. They years? started in 2015, I believe, and I joined in 2016. Yeah, so, so like six, six years, years almost. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, I'm, I, I that's crazy know. to say out loud, and right? Think about even to my I. Hey, but you guys have uh, two albums. Yep. Um, and we have an EP and an album. EP and album. Yeah, yeah sorry. You know, I've but I've, two releases. Two yeah. releases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and honestly, I've uh, I actually have used um some of your well, I think I guess I used your music. In the movie that was about you, so I <laughs> yeah, got that legal sure. permission and no copyright fridges there. But uh, it works, man. It's really good. It's really good vibes. Like, uh, Thank you. I, I believe it's Nick on the vocals, right? Uh, well, originally it was Nick. Uh, I started playing bass at the beginning. Yep. Um, and then just you know, thing things changed. Uh, there's man. a long story, but things yeah. went one way. Like Nick was having some problems with his vocals, the like chords, and that sort of thing. Getting oh, that's fine. Yeah, then, you don't want to exhaust your voice, he, man. He honestly, he is a better bass player than I am. Oh, so right. we decided to switch because I really liked. I wanted to do vocals in a band, and uh, you have great vocals too, man. Thank you. Man. I'm definitely gonna link. Uh, I'm definitely gonna link the video we made. Um, I, I mentioned that I think earlier in the video, but I'm gonna link that. But it's just for people to check out because for sure, um, it, you you are the singer in the live performance that were there. Yeah, and, you know, that actually, the footage that you have is one of the first times that I ever did vocals, and it was like it was that was the show that Nick blew his voice during a show, and he had to, I we had to switch. Oh, and that's because I knew because he they couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, I can't do it. So I voice. finished the set, and that's uh, after we just decided to switch. So oh, that is crazy. actually the first time. 
So that's and it a, was a fluke. And we, it wasn't meant to. Wasn't be. meant to be, but it's now on history. It, it's on video. It's, still, it's there. We're, the line, we're still together, and it's still the way it is. Dude, now. I still think all that video footage is on that terabyte hard drive. I still have. <laughs> so you know, I can give it to you if you guys want to make a movie. Yeah. Once you guys get famous, the documentary <laughs> gets made about watering hole. Yeah. So. Uh, so. With Watering Hole, then, um, there's been, you guys said there's been changes. I know for, I know just thinking off the history of Watering you guys are a straight, just four-piece band. You guys started as a four-piece, Cody on drums, uh, Ryan on guitar. The original lineup was, that was correct, but it had Foster Zoldi in the band. Oh, no way. Connor Huey. Okay, so it was originally six-piece. Yeah. So they were the, but they, that was just for that first show. And then, uh, yeah, I think that after that, it was me, Ryan, Nick, and Cody. And, yeah. Oh, and Jacob. We had one other guitar player. Yeah, and time. then uh, and Zach as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, throughout the years, the homies, yes, yeah. had, you guys Two had a great couple... guitar players. Yeah, yeah, incredible guitar players, absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, the band basically at the core of <coughs> the four of us, we're the it's, majority of our active. It's just worked better with the four? I, like, yeah, I don't I know if you guys... it's just... Uh, it's just the way. Of, it's just the way. The, it's just the way it's gone. It's the way the time or the way the wind goes. You know, right on your know, metaphors or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I'm a Blink One Eight Two diehard fan, and you know, I can take that where you know I understand Tom's doing angels and airways and not yeah. Blink right now, but uh, I don't know that I can look at Blink with a new singer and yeah. you know, but it's, it's just tense. chemistry, right? We just exactly everything. We've had no reason to make it any different. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, talk, I guess, talk a little bit more about uh, the watering hole in business that you've, uh, the whole, within, you said the within a majority of your music career has been with watering hole. Uh, tell me a little bit about, like, just that journey with watering hole. Yeah, um, well, we started out much the same as the Davis Losers did, just playing shows in Windsor, Sarnia, Chatham, London. That was like the circuit, you know, the 401, you know, maybe you go to Toronto, maybe Quebec. Yeah. Which our first trip was to Quebec. Right on. Know, like our first weekend, we... Across the border. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a yeah. Putin, you was a, dirty Ontarians. That was our first time really like not a not a tour by any means, but just going out. Yeah, like just a show out of province, five man. Days That's huge. We played three shows, I think. Dude, five days is a mini tour in my books. Yeah, just being out with each other and uh yeah, we went and did Montreal, Quebec and uh, Ottawa and that That's was amazing. like probably like Still one of my favorite things we ever done. Just like even that music took us to a place like Quebec City, which yeah, in my took opinion you to is a... like one of the most beautiful places in Canada. Really? I have to go Quebec. sometime, man. So just like that was like one of our first big accomplishments. And then, uh, yeah, we just, I mean, we really, we played a lot of shows since then. Just, you know, all around Ontario. We played Detroit once. Which is a moment of my high. I, yo, tell because I know this is a huge moment. Tell me about the Detroit show because if I'm not mistaken, if you've seen Eight Mile, I'm pretty sure you you were in Eight Mile, and I mean the movie. Very, very near to the area of Eight Mile, that area of Detroit. There was a venue called the Sanctuary. Well, the venue is still called. It's still a running venue in a different location in Detroit. Okay, it's moved now. Yeah, it was uh, an old church that got renovated into a venue. Our buddy Maxwell. Well, now, buddy, obviously. Not yep, yep, not uh, at the time, but now ended up he, creating uh, the bar. And uh, it was one of the most, still to my favorite venue, most unique, like, experience I've ever been. It was, like, just, um, like, a community, you know? Like, yep. it was, like, a patio outside. Everybody would hang out. You That's know? amazing. It was sick. It was BYOB because it like, wasn't a real business. Mm -hmm. So you could just bring cases of beer. You could just hang out. Friends hang and out. And all these great bands from all over the States. I saw bands from England come through there. I saw bands. Like, we... That was a very... We went there all the time. Yeah, and, yeah. But, yeah, we played there, which... Playing in Detroit is just crazy, you know? So many legendary... For hardcore, especially. Oh, know? absolutely, man. The history. The history yeah. within Detroit is so, so rich. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, Water and Hole, we played lots of shows over the years. We put out an EP. We just put out a record last year. Um, yeah, I, I, there's just, we've just been giving her, man. We've been giving her, man. It's been, her, been, man. It's the been you know? That's like, awesome. And it, it obviously, if COVID wasn't, right, uh, COVID wasn't around right now, you guys probably on tour. I would just be doing I, We definitely thing. were starting to plan for tours before all of this happened. And, yeah, it's, you know, you can't. I'm not gonna complain too much. No, but you, dude, of you course know, not. Bigger fish to fry. But. Of course. Well, yeah. and uh, the bigger fish to fry thing is what I kind of wanted. To, I was gonna lead into it, but the bigger fish to fry is a perfect way to lead into it. All right. You are also not just a band member, but I would look at uh, as a huge brand ambassador for the community of hardcore. I appreciate that. Yeah, That's dude. A, um, like, quite a title. It is. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not anyone to give the title out, obviously. <laughs> who the hell am I, right? No, who am I to give that title out? Uh, but, 
in my opinion, and I was, you know, I think I was very involved in the music scene in London when I was there. You know, I met a lot of incredible music, like musically talented people. I worked, uh, worked at the, saw a lot of venues, you know, worked with, talked yeah. to the people at the venues, Great city events. For playing music. Incredible city. So many amazing venues, little bars and everything with stages. Oh, uh, and even just festivals that would end up happening where they would exactly. allow Fanshawe students to play and stuff. Incredible. Um, you really, like, introduced me to a lot of new people in that community and new venues and stuff that opened up, you know, my my social group to meet a lot of new people and stuff like that. For sure. Um, how how did you get to that point, man? How did you get, like, obviously, I know what you, uh, you know, you got a, you know, 10 years of, let's say 10 years of, you know, we're, we're yeah, coming up. Yeah. From, uh, from nine to 19, let's just say of working in that community there or yeah. doing bands. How did you end up getting, like, how did you end up representing how did you do it? Because <laughs> well, I want I want other people to watch it, sorry, to to be able to to learn to how to do it in their community as well. For sure. Because I think it's not as hard as people think. Like not 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 trying to not that sounded totally wrong. I want to cut myself off there because it is a lot of work. But you have to it's representing things and brands in the right yeah. way and working with the right people, connecting people. For sure. I'm sorry, I'm just I'm I'm almost rambling because I'm like ah. No, no worries. So, um. I would say like it, that aspect of things started still when I was young, like maybe 14 and 13, I would go to the local shows and um, who, the guys that were putting on the shows at the time, like the promoters like Jay, uh, I don't know if Jay Dino back in the day would do shows for a new beginning and everything. Yep. And uh, I was just like, I would started to talk to Jay who was older, like I was 14 and he was in his 20s already, but I was just talking to him, you know, as a kid who was just eager to like learn about yeah, you know, just learn the scene. ropes basically yeah. like because he was someone who was putting these things on and making things happen which was such a huge part of like my life and i loved like that was like the only thing i really cared about at the time mm. so um when he would put on shows you know he would let me get involved with like he i would come early and help him set up the doors or help him with setting up the show little things like that just to help me kind of see what goes on behind the scenes which yep. i'm very thankful for that Jay, so like I, we don't talk that much these days, but still a great dude. Oh, yeah, man, roads city. have just gone different ways. You know, yeah. it's just yeah. But um, so when I was fourteen, I believe, or fifteen, um, was when I played or we booked our for my first show with my friend Will, who I believe you know, Will Grant, of course. Yes, yes, I know Will Grant. Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um. No, I mean, I, I, I know, I know, I know Will, I'm not going to get in, I know, I know Will, amazing <laughs> guy, I was going to be, I was going to reference a real cool story that I got with Will, but I mean, I just, I'm not going to waste my time, I'm just going to let you go on, because I'll get rambling and I don't want to go Go on. But, uh, so me and Will, it was actually a very last minute scenario, um, so Will, or, so I had got a message from a friend of mine, just a friend from the hardcore scene I'd met, he played in bands in London, and he was starting to get involved with booking tours for bands. And um, he messaged me and said that a band from Toronto and a band from the States had a tour date fall through and it was like the routing was kind of coming near Chatham. So he kind was, of right along that 401 he plaza. He was like, can you uh, make anything happen basically? And as a 14 year old kid who saw this opportunity, I really wanted to make it happen. It was a week's notice. So most shows you plan a couple months ahead. Yeah, you get, you get a little get more time. Money. But... Will was trying to do show. He had done a couple shows already, and uh, same age as me. Like we both were eager, ready, wanted to do it. So we uh, called up as many venues as we could. Got a bunch of no's because they're what is hardcore, what is moshing. Yeah, that is that whole. Yeah, people don't know or don't like it. Yeah, almost. like because they're again the misinformed. So we were kind of scrambling. Well, I mean, not miss, what never going. No, oh, no worries. No. Um, it's just like, you know, it's just like understandable how they could be misinformed, but yeah. it's a, it's an incredible scene. Yeah. Um, thankfully, we had one place that answered, which was T-Bones. T-Bones. Family Steakhouse. Yes, in Chatham here. Um, so they let us do the show, which I... But I think they regret to this day. No, no. Um, ah, table might have thrown a window. Eating, or was their families eating? And those are like a metalcore band's western. Oh, no. At the same time? Yeah. You uh, can't have people eating while a band's performing. It was chaos. But it was awesome. Like, people came. We lost some money. Expected, you know, whatever. And the show happened. And that was really the start of it all. We, uh, since the, me and Will after that, just booked, you know, various shows while we were in high. I was in grade nine at that time. So okay. during high school, it was mostly me, Will, and with the help of Nick, we would uh, 
throw local shows when we could. It was right hard. On. But uh, getting groups together locally that wanted to perform just for people yeah. and get them together in order to yeah, show you. Yeah, have some bands come from out of town if we could and right you know, on. just make the most of it. Yeah. And that continued until I was probably about 18, like before I left Chatham. So okay yeah, okay and, uh, but in terms of like the like you're saying meeting people and kind of the connections of things yeah because then like yeah. you end up moving to london right and then like you end up really like not that you didn't like it was like uh you grew you grew an incredible scene in chatham here that i would assume would have the word would have spread you know people from other communities obviously would have known and you know try to help send bands and stuff for sure but then when you move to london um it like obviously london, london is an incredibly musical talented city with the mia programs in western um, of you know, I even know a couple of people who are in like, uh, you know, singing programs at Western, you know, and they're just, you know, like incredible, incredibly talented people. It's a very artistic city. Or very, city, man. So. Artistic, not autistic. Um, you yeah. know, uh, so if you explain, I guess just explain the, explain the migration to London and then the, almost like the moving a pot of like a, a flower to a new garden. Oh, for sure, man. That's a good way to put that. Yeah. Right? Um, Cause the flower never died. No, it didn't. It almost it just grew into an incredible bushel of flowers. Big bud, you know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, <laughs> um, so I moved to London when I was eighteen, like right after high school for college. Just I, I had some friends who already lived there, and uh, they had a house that I could move into. And you know, I looking back, I, I didn't finish the program, so maybe was a mistake but it's growing you know that's learning right there exactly. yeah and i know a lot of people who've gone to college and didn't finish yeah. the programs you know so i moved there i had a bunch of friends from london already from the hardcore scene because chatham definitely had a music scene but london had like a hardcore scene that was more dedicated yeah call the office music hall yeah, run runners, runners yeah. yeah run runners six so i was stoked just to move to a city where i could you know start bands with these people and actually like and do the ground like get on the ground and do things instead of sitting an hour away hope wishing that, wishing i could be there watching yeah. videos so that was just big like just meeting new people where you go to these hardcore shows where everyone wants to play the music i want to play yeah um i just i think hardcore just became and still is like the thing i'm the most passionate about and just it was some... when i moved there and it still it grew over those years so i just wanted to meet everyone that was going to shows and just I'm like, you and know, it's a community. We can all, it'll yeah. grow. The more everybody is like friendly with each other, everybody is. Everybody talks to each other. It's a very yeah, open it'll community. Flourish. Like, you gotta yeah. make the garden grow, right? Make so. the garden grow. And that's the one thing that I kind of like about the garden exp uh, expression there, kind of unintentionally. London is kind of like that garden. Forest City. Yeah, oh, dude, Forest yeah. City. I don't like to refer to it because if you look at it from afar, they're cutting a lot more forest down than they're planting. But uh, yep. that's an issue for you, London. Um, I don't know if anybody from London's gonna watch this, yeah. but maybe. Um, but that is a big thing where I think there are a lot of it's a lot of musically talented people being moved onto the same garden that are then able to connect. The 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 roots are finding each other under the soil, and then everybody's connecting. It's Absolutely, and with London having the music industry arts program that is renowned, like in Ontario and canada i'm sure i mean i could be speaking i wouldn't even say because yeah. there's a couple but recording studios in london that, too that are so awesome. it brings all these music musicians to one city that mm -hmm. are from all these different places all these different backgrounds so i think that's like it just makes it like a melting pot a melting know, pot just yeah like simmering together you know yeah dude that's a and great way to put it it's a, yeah yeah i just found the london scene was great it was a great place to like learn and meet new people and make connections that are like lifelong connections and friendships and that yeah. will uh make this all you know Hopefully, you know, after COVID's over, we can get back to doing this, but... Yeah, man. Well, like, let's, let's just, yeah, that's, let's plan, you know, let's look at what's going to happen after, you know, after the COVID, because that's yeah. really what's going to, you know, we're, we're, we're slowly but surely all probably going to get vaccinated, you know, and sure. uh, the world's going to slowly but surely open back up and... You know, thing the shows will resume and it will have we'll have peace again in this yeah, community. I mean that is one very important musicians if you're not thinking about it, you gotta start. You gotta start. If we don't start now then We could lose it, man. Yeah, and people and yeah, don't wait until things are open and all the venues are booked. Get no, thinking man. about it now. Get optimistic. There's a big, uh, actually, my huge uh, Jeff Burrows. I'm not sure if you uh, know Jeff Burrows, uh, the drummer from the Tea Party. Um, I know of him, for sure. Yeah, yeah, he was a guy that I used to follow as a radio DJ in 95 on The Rock when I was a kid. And I always remember I used to hear about him just talk about, you know, just the music scene and all this stuff. And I just started following him. And he posted something really interesting a couple weeks ago where he said, 
right now the scene is the worst it's probably ever been you know this is the time where you need to buy the band's merch you need to you need to listen to the music on the streams you need, over and over you For know sure. you need to support them you need to you need to donate to these venues causes and their charities and everything because right now is the time where we all need to work together as a community you know yeah. um, we have to give back to the community that gave so much to us exactly man there's actually uh, my mom uh, I actually shouldn't give too many details away but uh, there is a, a little boy right now Seth uh, I mean if I'm not mistaken is his name okay. and uh, he has um, like a, a little like a, uh, a machine oh. on his heart and I think I saw I, yeah, the, ahead, the community is all about it, though. That's a, that's what I was gonna kind of segue into. So like, you're definitely welcome to jump in here. But uh, the the little boy, he's I think he's only ten years old, and the, there's a little machine that keeps his heart pacing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, for sure. And the machine just stopped, and he his heart was like it wasn't beating for you know uh, for who knows how long, a minute or two probably. However long it took a child to get inside to get a teacher to get the to the, yeah. the deep in machine, which. I know um, it, when I was in the hospital scene with my whole accident, you know, six, six years ago, five, six years ago now, um, I remember hearing about that. There was a big push to have these AED machines everywhere, and I'd never understood why. And now I totally understand why, because this, like, if there wasn't a machine there to call an ambulance, to get the ambulance there, to get the machine to just try and get the heart started again would have been minutes man exactly like, almost five minutes exact plus you know yeah. and um we just saw it recently with dmx where you know we you know he his like his like uh, i think it was his brain or his heart shut off a heart attack i believe for like yeah for like 30 minutes almost before they were able to get to, and that you know unfortunately rest in peace dmx but uh they, oh, oh, oh yeah <laughs> you know uh but like you know it's a very unfortunate situation for that little boy but Right now, all I'm seeing is people trying to help the family with costs, and you know, because this is a time where, if anything, you know, you want to be with your kid who, if I'm not mistaken, is in Toronto right now, and you know, Toronto is three hours away from Chatham. It's not a close distance, and especially um, with COVID, with, everything's going to be makes harder. it so much more stressful. Yeah, especially when you might not even be able to be there with your kid, because I know. I'm hearing a lot of stories where people are just being left to die alone. It's not that that's going to happen to the kid, but like in <laughs> in sure. in these hospitals, man, it's crazy. People are just leaving COVID patients to die. Um, there's actually a story, a real sad story. I don't want to get diverted, but there's a sad story of a nurse in Mexico. They're filling up surgical gloves with warm water oh, so that so yes. that patients don't feel like they're alone when they're dying. That is wear masks, people. That is the most heartbreaking Please. thing ever, man. Yeah, let's just like try and stop together. It's not hard to social distance from each other. It's not hard to wear a mask in places yeah. indoors. It, it it isn't. We're allowed to take the mask off in restaurants when we're eating. It really isn't hard to wear the mask when you go into. I don't know. I don't. We're gonna get diverted. Yeah. Um. um you actually had something you, before because I gotta wrap. We gotta wrap these things up here. I'm trying to keep them under yeah, 45 the minutes to an hour. Community. The community. Least. Yeah. You had a, you had mentioned earlier to me something really important. I definitely want to get this out there because I think it's a, a huge thing we all need to know about. Yeah, for sure. Um. So, uh, I have a friend of mine who uh, he's from the U.S. lives in Indiana. I, just in case I got it wrong, I'm sorry, Josh. I believe you live in Indiana, though. but uh, Starts with an I. Yeah, yeah, so my friend Josh, uh, his family, unfortunately, has been affected by one of the worst things that we have to do with as humans, which is cancer, unfortunately. Um, they have a little girl named Skylar. Um, unfortunately, she's terminal with cancer. And at this point, you know, they're just trying to raise some money to uh, do the bucket list and okay. get everything done, you know? Enjoy her time while she's As here, much life know? as you can. Absolutely. And, um, so the one thing is like within the hardcore scene, there's been a lot of bands that have been helping out to uh, raise money for this. And that's actually yeah. what this t-shirt is here. Bane, right on. Team Skylar. Um, so I just wanted to bring some attention to it. Uh, we'll put the links in the description, description. below. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That was my timer He's for the, the warning. <laughs> yep. uh, hey. We'll put the description below. Definitely. Um, just anything, you know, if you can help out, uh, you know, you just got to give back to the community and uh, it'd be great to see any help, you know, or even just share it and, uh, Hopefully just we can other people can make see things them. in the world a little bit better, you know. People helping people, man. Habitat for me, Andy. I like yeah. to. Uh, I think that's a good way to good way to end it. All right, brother. Hey, thank you so much for being the first guest on second season of Carbon Toast Podcast. Thank you. S sorry, I was drinking water and it's it's burping now. But uh, thank <laughs> you so much, brother. Um, thank you. 
Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. You know, it's always fun to, uh, you know, I love hanging out with you. So. Yeah, it's a good hangout. It's a good just conversation. 45 yeah. minutes flew by like that, you know. Um, maybe look forward to this series uh, in the summer. Um, I am planning on hoping to try and get like some kind of concert garage series going, maybe like a backyard series, something where we just get the music community going and uh, play music with each other um, in somebody's garage. Um, so I got to find that person with a garage. That will let us play music in it, and uh, yeah, I think I know someone with a garage. Yeah, but I mean, I I mean, if my dad will let me use a big shop, maybe. <laughs> you know, large shows. No, out of capacity. I'm kidding. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to Crawford's House Podcast. Thank you for Tanner for being thank here. Thank you. And uh, as always, uh, check back uh, if everything goes to plan. I'll have a new episode every Monday. I'm um, hoping to crank out a couple more episodes. Um, you know, maybe have two episodes a week, obviously, depending on how many. Uh, I guess I can get uh, working together here with a couple other parties to jointly book guests uh, to book the best guests we can possible. Um, I, if everything goes to plan, I've already confirmed it. Everything goes wood. If the technicalities and everything don't have any and everything's good, I will have, uh, yeah, knock on uh, like plastic. Um, <laughs> Uh, I will have one of the biggest guests I will have ever had in my life. That is including my radio time. That is including my uh, Drivewire time, which we had some incredible guests on Drivewire. Um, and that's gonna, it's going to really hopefully change my life and uh, maybe change yours as of year as well. Hey, maybe I could even talk to the – maybe I could just see about, like, I don't know, doing a giveaway or something. I don't know. I'll give them some money. You can send me some stuff to give away. You guys like Croftnator merch? I'm in the shoot of doing it right now. I have a logo in the works. We are working on getting some Crawfordator merch out for you. Uh, anything you buy from us would just help uh, support, uh, you know, myself and, uh, well, this place, you know, give me some new art on my wall, maybe. That'd be awesome. I got some. It's not high, but no worry. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, I got to quit it with the ums. I know that's for sure, but uh, how, how do we wrap this? Is that a wrap? Is that a wrap? It's a wrap. Where the hood at? Rest in peace, DMX. Rest in peace. That's a cut.